There's wine, there's herring, there's seltzer, there's kiddish cookies. We're just gonna get started in a, in a moment. We're setting up our Instagram Live. If you need a refill on your wine or seltzer, kiddish cookies or herring, we have a kiddish here tonight. Weeknight Everything's kiddish. kosher. Weeknight kiddish. There's four kinds of herring. I don't wanna, you know, I don't want people to feel, you know, too Limited. pressured, but also you should try a little bit of each. Starting to start our intro music. Hey, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Rip Radis Brooklyn. Thank you so much for coming. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Oh. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I do have an official introduction, though. We're excited to have the Hanukkah Erotica Book Club here for a special live podcast tonight. Hosts, uh, Razel and my... Malia, thank you. We'll chat about Eight Kinky Nights by Zan West. Um, please feel free to shop and enjoy afterwards. If they convince you to read the book, we have it. Uh, and otherwise, enjoy. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you so much to the Rip Outis for having us. Thank you to all of you for being here. We are so excited. I am Razel. I'm Malia. We're stepsisters. Yes. And we are the co-hosts of the Hanukkah Erotica Book Club. I think a lot of you may may know us and know a little bit about our history, but we don't know all of you, so we'll share with you a little bit about our history. But a year ago, on right before Hanukkah, I was tucking my daughter in and scrolling through the Libby app looking for a book to read. And all of a sudden, I got served several Hanukkah romances, a genre I didn't know existed until a year ago. And the first thought was, I need to write one, which pivoted very quickly to, I have to read all of these. And I started screenshotting the covers and book descriptions, posting them to my Instagram, and people started to respond. And I started to read a K.K. Hendon book called I'll Be Home for Hanukkah, which spoke to many of us. And Myself Mal included. Malia slid into my DMs. Sure did. She said, this book is really speaking to me. And I said, we have to podcast about this. William thought that it was just going to be a fun way for us to be on Zoom and hanging out together. And a year later, we're here live at the Rip Bodice. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here and to chat with you all about this great book. But before we dive into the book, Tonight we have a kiddish, as you know, kiddish cookies, herring, Dorks. kosher wine, seltzer, and we wanted to know from you if, when you go to a kiddish, what your kiddish cookie, your go-to kiddish cookie is. We read a book with we read several books that feature kiddishes in in Jewish romance novels, and there was actually a one that a major plot point turned on the good versus bad kiddish cookies. Oh yeah, a whole thing about the kiddish cookies. It was like a whole cu a couple like that were in love broke up over New Jersey based kiddish cookies which these are tonight. So, this is highly topical. Does anyone have Yeah, what's yours? A crumbly cookie with a weird consistency sprinkle. I think we have that one. I know what you're talking about. It's My husband's crumbly. nodding. He definitely knows. Would you just call it a sprinkle cookie or it's it's unique to kit to it's like unique because you see them at Shiva's or at kiddishes. <laughs> My mom, my mom has one. We're going to give you a mic. It's the, it's the sandwich cookie with the jelly in the middle, and then it's dipped in chocolate, and then you dip the chocolate in the sprinkles. Oh, the sandwich cookie. Yeah, the sandwich yeah, cookie. Yeah, sandwich with cookies. The jelly Half in sprinkles middle. jelly on the inside, dipped in chocolate. That's it. I love that too because she's my mommy. Do we have that one? I don't know. I think we have sandwich cookies tonight. I, don't, I know we have sprinkle cookies. I think we have sandwich cookies. Any other favorite kiddish cookies? Oh, we have a hand. Um, so I actually grew up in the UK, so we didn't have the New Jersey cookie plate. We had um, Costco's like cho like triple chocolate fudge cake that was cut into a bazillion little slices, and I would eat like six of those. Mm. That's the you're so hungry and thirsty after a morning in shul. Tastes so good. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Any others? Rainbow cookies are popular. Bow ties. Bow ties. Bow ties. I I love a Linzer tart cookie. Like mm -hmm. the, it's, just, it's basically like you're eating two cookies in one. And I love the like rainbow. We used to yeah, call them rainbow, rainbow, rainbow cookies. cookies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah rainbow they, cookies. Rachel told me that when we discussed this. Yes. They have almond in them. I didn't know that. Jess loves rainbow cookies. She's sitting in the front. She I loves a rainbow love cookie. Those. Now, herring has come up in our in some of um, our 
books also. Kiddish's herring. Right. Malia doesn't even need a cracker to chase her herring. I love herring. Immediately, any kiddish, I'm hitting the herring hard. And there's no need for a cracker, but I do appreciate that that's the most popular way to eat herring, which is why I provided crackers for everyone. But I think herring straight up is the way to go. And I will say this, that um, I never really used Venmo as a social media app, but I saw on my Venmo when I was going to pay for some random thing for my kid that Malia had procured her herring on Venmo yes, for tonight. Yes, Shana. So I, com- so I commented, LOL. And I was like, this is my first comment ever on a Venmo payment. Ever. Like, Venmo's actually social media. I've gotten likes on a Venmo, but never an actual comment. Like, yeah, LOL likes to be like, payment. confirmed, I received your payment. Right. Right. Yes. But she procured the herring for tonight via Venmo. And I put... And I laughed. And my payment came with fish emoji, Hanukkah, menorah emoji, thank you hands emoji. So yeah. I think Rach- that Rachel understood from that exactly what was happening. Yeah, it was the herring for tonight, so... I felt really excited about that. Yeah, I appreciated that. I well, if there's any other kiddish cookies or thoughts on herring, we'd love to hear from you. Um, because usually it's just Molly and I, a little bit of William in the background. Um, but tonight we're here with all of you and we're so happy that you're here. Yes, yeah. we would like to hear some other thoughts on some of the topics we've we've gone totally. over in the past. Now, no pressure because I think that you know from Hanukkah Erotica Book Club that we're reading the book so you don't have to truly in right. a, lot, a lot of the time. But we do have some listeners who read along with us. Did anyone tonight read Eight Kinky Nights in advance of tonight? Okay, we yes. have a hand. <laughs> Leah's read it. Leah owns the bookstore and has read Eight Kinky Nights. So we're going to tell you a lot about this book that you know nothing about. And um, I think I'm going to start with what we like to do on the podcast, which is the book description. Are we Please. ready to dive in? Absolutely. Okay, great. Sometimes the perfect Hanukkah gift can change everything. Newly divorced, Stone Butch Jordan moves into her friend Leah's spare room. Did you say Leia or Leah in this book? I think I said Leah. Okay. Ready at 49 to take on a new job and finally explore kink and polyamory. But moving to NYC during the holidays sends grief crashing through her. And Jordan realizes that when she isn't solely focused on caring for others, her own feelings are unavoidable, including her feelings for Leah. 51-year-old queer femme Leah, an experienced submissive kink educator who owns a sex shop, has recently come to terms with being gray ace and trying to rework her life and relationships to honor that. Leah has a brainstorm to help them both. She offers Jordan eight kink lessons, one for each night of Hanukkah, to help Jordan find her feet as a novice dominant and to create a structured space where Leah can work on more deeply honoring her own consent now that she knows she's gray ace. Don't worry, we'll define the terms. She planned to keep it casual, but instead the experience opens cracks in the armor Leah's been using to keep people at a distance and keep herself safe. Now she needs to grapple with the trauma that's been impacting her life for years. Can these two autistic queers find ways to cope with the changes they are making in their lives and support each other as they build something new they hadn't thought was possible? This kinky polyamorous Hanukkah F slash F romance includes a friends to lovers, roommates to lovers, kink lessons, seasoned romance, and getting your groove back tropes. And polyamorous, gray ace, pansexual, Jewish, fat, autistic, disabled, arthritis, PTSD, and depression representation. Damn. Damn. So that's why we chose it. Right. Self-evident. <laughs> Before we start, the cover... First alone. Of all, I think everyone needs to see your version with the tabs. Look at look at this professional sort of academic preparation going on here. Those are like legal post-its that first time. I have here, those in my desk drawer. Yeah, we work. use them at work. They're I don't from use work. them, but you know, um, they were in my desk drawer. There you go. Okay, so this cover says it all. And if you're listening, you can definitely just Google the cover. But off the bat, Jordan and Leah are both, I think, very sexy. Totally. They're very Ve- very sexy. I'll say this about this book. It's like one of the most sensual books that we've read. And I don't even just mean like sex wise, like everything is about their sensory experiences. Yes. Because yes, because a big part of this book is that both of these characters have autism and they're feeling they're, they're very connected to their senses. Exactly. Not always sexual. Right. And also they're older. Like I, I think most of the books that we've read, the main characters tend to be younger even if they're adults, they're sort of younger adults kind of like looking for love. These people are like 50 around. And so they've had like a lot of time to learn about what they like, what they don't like. And it seems like a lot of like 
Like they're constantly pausing and being like, what food do I want right now? Oh, I know. It's garlic bagel chips with cream cheese to dip in it. And a glass of cold apple juice. Yes. Which I wanted. I want apple juice and bagel chips. Right. Right. The cream cheese, I don't I no. don't think I want. Oh, I completely agree with you. That's like, I mean, you want that on an actual They bagel. lost us, actually, once they in- introduced cream cheese. Right. But the apple juice, garlic bagel chip combo sounds good to me. The book is filled with delicious descriptions of food like this. Yes. But again, I feel that some of it comes from... I think it's possible age, like may- maybe they know what they need in the moment that they need it. Yes. But, so, and also, by the way, a big part of this book is it's body positive. It's about their fatness. Right. And food kind of like nourishing something in them at different times. Yes. And they have very specific things they need at different times, which I think we all do, but they have major food cravings and I deeply related to it. Totally. Like at one point, one of the characters is sick. And in the moment that she's very sick, she needs this like spicy Thai soup, this like spicy Thai coconut soup with chilies. Like, Sounds great. Amazing for like when day. you're not feeling well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're in the city. It's also very New York-y, I want to point out. Yes, which I like because they're always, I mean, they can procure any kind of food at any moment. And like there was this one scene. Okay, so we talked about in a previous book on a previous podcast that you may or may not have listened to. Um, the combo of a character cooking brisket and eating it with latkes. They and do I that was, here too. And I was saying that that sounded like a great combo, but I, I don't associate brisket and latkes. Like to me, brisket is like a different holiday, not a latka holiday. But here, there was one where they, they went to a diner and the character was like, oh, of course I want borscht and latkes. And I was like, okay, that also sounds amazing, although I would never associate those two and things. And the thing is, I, I didn't we didn't start by saying this. This book's written by Zan West and... There's in general, Zan's writing is very deliberate and very descriptive. It's very wordy, but the way that they describe the borscht and the earthiness of the borscht, like I could taste it. Yes. And then they're talking to each other about it. Like they're like, I just had this great borscht. Ooh, I love earthy flavors. That feels great when you're when you're seeking like comfort and and stability. Like they, right. they know like what textures and foods are associated with feelings. Exactly. Well, I loved it. Let's start with how hot they are. Um, okay, so Leah is femme, right? Which means, and she Leah's the gray ace. You may, in the description, have wondered what's gray ace. When I sent the book description to one of my best friends, Jamie, who's not here, she's in Boston. I'm sure she's watching. She sent sent me a text back. Google's gray ace. Um, <laughs> so gray ace. So ace is asexual, not interested in physical sex, and gray ace is like on on, not sure sometimes not wanting it right not not wanting sex always right and not exactly a not completely asexual but like on a path not a path towards asexuality necessarily but it's gray yes i thought it had to do with them aging right being older like it was a gray right my hair's gray right right, right. i thought it was like a you know like a silver fox totally also because jordan's a stone butch so i thought gray ace was like a hot, sexy, asexual person with gray hair. With gray hair. Because Distinguished. their hair, their, Danielle is here, their hair, um, you know, becoming gray because now they're, they've been friends for, for life. Right. Many of our friends for life are here tonight. Yeah. Shari, my, my first friend, Emily, my oldest friend from college, Danielle, lots of old friends are here and we'll see each other age. So they're talking a little bit about the aging. I thought gray ace was about that. It's not. Right. It's about... A little bit of asexuality sometimes. Right. Gray old, being like not black, not white. Exactly. But in the middle exactly. in terms of her feelings. But, the, but she's coming to terms with this identity also because remember, I know you will, from the book description five minutes ago, <laughs> Leah is a sex educator. She owns a sex store in the city. She's not just a sex educator. She's a sex and kink educator and she's a submissive. So having this ID, this new identity that maybe she's gray ace is, is significant for her. I'll tell you what, though, that segues to something else that I thought about this book, which is like these characters spend no time working. Oh, they are. They have so much free time. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I mean, there might be someone here who can give us insight into owning a bookstore or a shop in general. But I would think that that would take a lot of time. Like, it's not just like, you know, you have a whole business on your shoulders or thinking about all different aspects of it. She's like occasionally Leah's like, oh, I'm going to get one of my friends to take over my shift. But like, that sounds like you just like clock in you clock out i don't that didn't that didn't make so much they sense they have a ton of free time and in that free time there's 
a lot of eating. There's a lot of talking and thinking about their identity. There's a lot of healing. Right. I have never spent that much time. Like they are so introspective. Right. And they, they spend so much time. I don't know. I mean, maybe this is part of sort of a um, like neurodiverse spectrum. Right. But they seem to they need a lot of time recovering from whatever experience they've just had. Yes. Even a positive experience. Oh, for sure. There's a lot of healing. And, and the thing is, some of it's I'm very interested in this idea that well, Zan, Zan West in the description of Zan. We know that Zan West had autism. Zan West died soon after this book came out, which is very sad. Um, it, it's very sad. Um and I actually just saw a recent, I read the reviews on Amazon. Sometimes I read them on the podcast, but I saw a recent review from very recent that said, I love this book so much. It really spoke to me and I can't wait to read more. And it mm, broke my heart. That is so sad. Um, so Zan West had autism and these characters have autism. And I, when I'm not podcasting about Jewish romance, I'm also a special educator and I, I, I know, know a, so, somewhat about autism, but this, I've never learned so much. There's no course in graduate school or, or college that has taught me more or textbook that has taught me more about autism than this book. I believe it. I, yeah, I, I really learned a lot about just, yeah, the need again, like knowing these are people who are very attuned to their sensory needs. Very, very, very. And also there are times where they they melt down. Right. There are times where they cannot make words. Right. They can't make words and they say it to each other. Sometimes they can't make words so much that they actually pivot and start DMing with each other because it's easier to text Oh, and I love when there were a few times in the book where Leah was like, I may not remember most of this conversation. And then the other character would immediately be like, oh, I'll summarize it and send you an email. And I was just like, can I say that to people? Like, I don't know. Yes, that's incredible. <laughs> like, I may not remember please, anything you're saying. Right. I'm really emotionally overwhelmed. Can you just b- highlight, send me a bullet point email with they the were, highlights of this conversation? I've never seen a book where people treat each other better and are yes. so good to each other. But the thing is... The un- part of why this is fascinating to me is that part of what's happening is that Jordan's realizing that she's a dom, a kink dom. Their yes. identity, her identity is that she's a dominant and Leah is a submissive and Leah wants to be, wants pain inflicted upon her. And so sometimes right. Jordan in their eight kink lessons and then spoiler alert, they fall in love. It's amazing. Actually, they fall in love. Yep. None of you read it. I they don't know if you will, realized, but they fall in love. And they kind of realized they were always in love, I think. Yeah. They were. They've always been really good friends to each other and always really in tune with each other's needs. But right. Jordan just got divorced. Right. And is comes coming to, to the city. Comes to right. the city to stay with Leah, who has a spare bedroom because the kink business is doing very well. Even though she right works not at all at it, but somehow it's doing well anyway. Yeah. And also they have so much money for takeout. They're constantly getting takeout. <laughs> they have just a huge budget right, for food. Leah has a gym membership. Like there's just a lot. Oh, yeah. Of, a lot. You know. But also here's the thing. They don't have kids. And I... Right. I don't know if it's just because I have kids and, you know, I think that that a lot of my time is spent with them. And so part of the times where they were just talking about their feelings and getting into these kink lessons and then also healing after there's aftercare after the kink lessons, it's also time consuming. I was thinking, is this because they don't have kids? But but then Malia told me, no, we actually never talk about the books before, but Malia had an interesting prep. perspective on this. Well, I was just saying, I think like we think that because we have kids. So a lot of our time that we would spend on aftercare from kink is actually being spent, you know, I don't know, changing diapers. But if we didn't have kids, we might be spending it on like a more demanding job <laughs> or, you know, I mean, I think that there's a lot other of thing. other, other things. things, other hobbies. They seem to be like they're they're sort of their their main preoccupation is caring for themselves yes and each other because they have sort of created this very family-like group of people who all seem to be jewish by the way yes yes talking about the jewish element yeah we will we we will do not fear this book has a lot of judaism woven in i'm really curious to talk to you about it yes but just talking about how hot they were really got me pivoting to i don't know food and all these other things right so leah is femme Yes, and you know what? She, I, I'm so annoyed because I she, there's great descriptions of Leah's outfits that I really like. She seems to have really fun fashion yeah. sense. Yeah. And there was one where she was dressing up and it described her outfit and she had dreidel earrings that she was going to wear. And I was like, I definitely used to have a pair of dreidel Ooh, earrings and I was digging and trying to find it. I think I got rid of it. But how fun, I don't know. A thing about me is I like like kitschy. Like yes. I have a, oh, I have a yeah. summer pair of earrings that are like popsicles. Like I like that yeah. kind of thing. We'll so get I would, for next year. Well, Molly will be in dreidel I would earrings. like a pair of dreidel earrings. But yeah. she just, she just, she dresses I don't know. She very, has great, very femme, right? Very so femme, traditionally sexy, girly, sexy yes. dresses. Like she has curls and a big rose tattoo right. and 
um, just like a big, curvy, gorgeous body, and she dresses really go- gorgeous. Right. And girly. Yes. Jordan loves it. Right. Jordan is extremely handsome. Like, I'm very attracted to Jordan. Right. Well, there were a couple of scenes where, like, Jordan rolls up her shirt sleeves. Oh, there's cufflinks. There's a whole thing. That was cufflinks. very hot. Like, that image of the rolling up yes, the shirt sleeves sir, to Because Leah calls Jordan sir when right. they're in their scenes. That was really... I, I, yeah. I liked that. The role. But, but Jordan has, like, great suits. There's a lot of her admiring other... Um, other like butch characters awesome suits yeah and boots jordan has a hot boot collection right right boot collection cufflinks suits but yeah they just they're really they're both very hot and they're very into each other but not if it you know it's it's a process because they were friends right and they were friends that really it seems like tried to shut out their sexual attraction to attraction to each other because Jordan was in the, in this long like sort of very vanilla marriage vanilla no kink no kink um also Jordan is stone stone oh yes yeah, stone butch another term I can define should you need it but it, if you are listening to the podcast you might remember from higher the there was a stone butch character in yes, yes. who was also this before. very hot right but Jordan's I forget the name of Jordan's Danny Danny was not into Jordan being stone there was a lot of just pushing Jordan to try to have like again vanilla sex and relationship right and now that's all finally ending. But while it was going on, Jordan had to really shut off Jordan's attraction to Leah. So And kink in general. Because right. Jordan was in a vanilla marriage. Right. But really, inside was a dom. Right. Always. And, right. But there was this interesting conversation of, well, what's it, is it a kink if you haven't really explored it? Like, is it just a fantasy? I was very interested in that. One thing. So it's taking place during Hanukkah. And there's a lot of different kind of Jewish things woven in. One thing Zan West does not do is define their terms. Right. These characters are just Jewish, inherently Jewish. Judaism is a part of their identity. Yes. Jordan's father died. Right. And the yard site is coming up, which we recently talked about at work because my dear friend and colleague Sarah's father had di- hit their, their yurt site was coming up, but didn't have a word for yurt site. Hmm. And it was, and we were using, I don't know, a different word, death anniversary. And I said, actually, there's a really good word in Judaism. And then Sarah came back the next Monday and was like, oh, the yurt site was this weekend. And it's a good word. Totally. It's a good word. Yeah. So Jordan's father's yurt site was, was coming up. Right. This brought up a lot. Yes. They were going to shul. Right. They're getting ready for Hanukkah. Right. And then it was a whole thing like, again, these characters are very attuned like to when they they're it, like something is too much for them and they need to like they need to cancel plans like they can't be overly planned like they need one plan and then like one afternoon with like a weighted blanket and an audiobook. like a hundred percent. There's like a lot it, of yeah. weighted blankets. There needs to be a lot of pacing, a lot of like downtime. So Leah's like, I can't come with you to shul for your father's yurt site, Jordan. Jordan's like tries to be very understanding these characters are very understanding of each other yeah so tries to be understanding but is also very disappointed and then jordan's sister erica erica comes in to like accompany jordan and be there together for their father's yeah. yeah yeah there are a lot of breaks naps weighted blankets comfort audiobooks comfort listens comfort reads but zan west also and watches like and some of them i oh and also there's a lot of music and some of them i intensely related to but then others you know, I could tell that if you were really into, let's say, like the Hobbit stuff, like right, that was right. really comforting for them. Yeah. But then, like random things where, like, they were just out of Jordan needed to all of a sudden listen to that song from Waitress. She used to be mine, which like I always have to listen to. So yeah. She is messy, but she's kind. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that song. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and other things too, like random things because they have a lot of interests. Right. And. I have some, and so some of them overlapped. But they would also have these moments where they would just like be inspired by something they saw in the Great British Break Off to make like a bunch of different tea sandwiches. Right, there were themed meals. They were like, I'm just going to make some tea sandwiches. And then the other one would be like, that would be that great. That would be amazing. Yeah. What were you thinking? And right. then they would describe like sev- a whole, you know, seven different kinds of tea sandwiches because they were just inspired in the moment. Right. Because they were like, well, I'm making a tea cake, so I should make seven tea sandwiches and like make an afternoon of it. Yeah. 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 It actually sounded great. Sounded amazing. I mean, I would like a f- good friend who does one, does some of these things and um, they could, I don't know, do it for me. Yeah, it would be <laughs> and great. And invite me to I would love in the fruits of it while I'm changing diapers. 
it, yeah, they were really good to each other. So Hanukkah comes and they had gone to this kink party together. It was Jordan's first kink party where they were experiencing things for the first time. I mean, really intense stuff. Really. That first scene at the party was very, we haven't read anything like this before no. in a year of no. reading stuff. Like this yeah. I think comes closest to like what I imagine an actual like the erotica Erotica. Genre erotica is. We yes. haven't really like read kink that. erotica. Yes. yes. That's why I'm saying there's something about that that's very interesting because the sex is very kind of graphic and I mean aggressive is the wrong word. Explicit? Explicit. But right. then it's like I've literally never read characters be so good to each other. Right. And I think that that's a big theme in the book is like them both discovering that you can be sort of like loving and attuned to each other's needs while like creating this other world where you're inflicting pain on each other. Because that was the other one needed. Actually, they both need that. Right. One but needs to give it and one needs to receive it. Right. But it's like in this context where like they've talked so much and processed so much that it's actually, I don't know, all very, I don't even want to say consensual because that's sort of minimizing. It's all just sort of like, I don't know, loving. Right. Yeah. The other thing is that there's a lot of talk about polyamory. Jordan right. has no interest in being in another monogamous relationship after her divorce from Danny. Right. And Leah's polyamorous. They have, she has multiple play partners and wants nothing to do with romance. She does not want to be in a relationship. Right. She wants to be in these different kind of play kink relationships. Yeah, it was so interesting because I guess naively, or maybe this just, yeah, I don't know, naively or narrow-mindedly, I kept thinking that jealousy would come up at some point. Like these characters are more and more realizing that they love each other but there's never a point where they're like, and I want you to stop playing no. with other people or I no. want you to stop having relationships with other people. Like, if anything, they were like totally happy for each other to see each other enjoying other relationships that never came up, not once. At one point, there's a character named Iris at this play party. And then when it was her turn to play the Goo Goo Dolls song, Iris came on. Yes. <laughs> I loved that. Right. They're like, I loved the music. There was really good music references. Uh, one of them is Jordan's like a big Disney fan yeah. and is always putting on like Disney soundtracks and then tells there's someone she's having a conversation with where she says that she writes Disney fanfic, like kinky yes. Disney yes. fanfic. Yes, yes. <laughs> and the other one's like, please email me some. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's a lot. I, I love when books kind of pivot to like DMing or texting. Like I really like that. Yes. I just feel I just like reading it. I just didn't there's letters, there's emails, there's texting. Also, they're DMing on Twitter. I didn't even know you could do that. Like I don't know that function on Twitter. I don't but have also, any Twitter followers. I just lurk. And so I've never DM'd anyone. The way these characters DM even is like hypersensitive, is yes. super sensitive. Like it's almost like they're DMing a play like a, a dialogue in a play because they have like set directions. Like yes. I don't know, when I text or whatever, I just text and I hope that people who know me know the tone or from the context. You're not like giggles nervously. Right, they're like putting like asterisk said in a gentle tone, asterisk, I don't want you to do that, you know, or whatever. Like it's like they yeah. need to sort of have these caveats yeah. to make sure nobody's feeling. And they all hurt. talk that way. Yes. It seems like it's a whole crew. One part, I mean, it's very sad to me that Zan West died, but I have read romance series where you kind of fall in love with one couple, but then each book kind of takes you through a different, you know, set of couples in this community and that would have been an amazing series. Totally. Starting with this, but I want to know about all of them. Yeah. There's a lot of characters in this book. I really loved them. It's also very New Yorky. So there's a scene where Jordan goes with one of the friends to a big gay ice cream in the West Village, yes. which our friends who were here tonight used to live near and love. And it evokes a lot of very New Yorky feelings to me. Totally. At one point, Leah is taking a stroll on St. Mark's Place in the East Village. It's just like, who hasn't just kind of like forlornly walked alone like through the, East Village. through the East Village on St. Mark's like touching crystals? I mean, if you haven't totally. all here, I don't know, but I have. And the thing is, we've Molly and I have talked before about how there's a lot of different genres of romance. Obviously, the Rip Bodice has tons. There's a lot of witch romances. Right. Leah's is a witch. Leah's is Wiccan. Is there's a, yes, there's a... Oh, but she has an altar. Leah has an altar. About that. Yeah, Leah's extremely layered she has crystals she's an altar she right. has an altar yes she, she puts them in different places and then she says at one point like you know even though she even though i'm she's jewish like it fills her soul and she's been able to kind of hold both spaces spaces for both right the wiccan part of her yes and her judaism yes i remember that now yes love that her crystals and the things that she puts on at different times have meaning for her. Right, right, right. And there's one point where Jordan like buys her a pendant with like a, a, a certain like 
I know. stone in some it. kind of crystal that like some of our friends here tonight know but we don't right exactly yeah <laughs> yeah um we'll ask you later yes um so yeah i i, I guess the, the back to the the autism part right i think the biggest lesson i've learned from this book is that i almost think there's a misconception that people with autism have a difficult time reading emotions now i think it's a misconception interesting because right. I've never read a book with people understanding their own and other people's emotions more ever. Right. And checking in with themselves. I feel like the most common thing was like, Leah checked in with herself. What did she need? And sometimes moment? there's lists. Right, right, right. A dance break. And then yes. it's like, I often need a dance break. I've never like, I need a dance break now and then take the dance break. But like, I'm, I often take dance breaks when I think about the way I operate. Right. I will stop and dance sometimes or put on a music, uh, put on a song I want to hear and dance. Right. But the way that she wrote it, it's like, one, need a dance break. Two, something crunchy to eat. Right, right. Three, it's very deliberate. Yes. Curl up, roll around on velvet. <laughs> there was a few some rolling on velvet. Yeah, not I in want a sexual that. way. Not in just a like sexual a, way. That's what I need texture wise to just relax me. Right, right. Sounds great. It does. And I do think. Well, I don't know. Like, are we going to talk about the? Um, the Hanukkah menorah lighting? Yeah, I wanted to actually hear your thoughts again. Sorry to go back to the audience if you're not ready for it. But when they light the menorah, I noticed that... So the first night, they light the menorah. They take turns, by the way, who lights. Right. Which is nice. Yeah. And we've read other Hanukkah romance books, obviously. This is our bread and butter. But lighting the menorah is sexy, we've decided. We decided last year. Totally dimly lit. There's candles. There's, you know, it's like extremely sexy. You're singing, you're chanting, you're looking out at the. Yeah. And they're together. Oh, so totally. first night they sing Mao's Sor. Classic. Classic. Show of hands if that's what you sing after you light the candle. Do you sing that post candle lighting? OK, it's a popular one. Denise does. A lot of people do. OK, that's what I sang growing up. So that's what we started to sing at home. I actually grew up singing a different one that is also referenced in this book. So the next one referenced in the book is one that I have heard at my in-laws' house, Haneros Halalu. That's what we sang. Can I get a, anyone want to sing that for me? Haneros Halalu. Guys, should we sing it? I think we should sing it. Okay. Haneros Halalu Anachnu Madlik. Yeah, I can't believe my voice. I don't voice. know it because I Hanero. just, I've heard it. I thought maybe Seth would sing it for Sounds us like tonight. Sounds like a dirge with me singing it. I thought Anachnu Seth would Madlik. sing it tonight because I think that that's my side of the, the, the in-laws. Jen, there's a seat for you in the front, I think. al She doesn't want it. No. Vialhanifla. Um, I could do the whole thing. Yeah, do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Vialhamilchamo. Shasita lavotenu bayamima heim baz. I never sang it. I didn't know it. The first time I ever heard it was, was at the Mince's house. You sing that, right? Your family? It's the from one. That's I what think. you sing. Yeah. yeah. So one night they sing that. Really right. cool. They switch off, yeah. I was wrong. There's no chair. Um, And then. <laughs> and then. Okay, but then. There's another one they sing. Yeah, well, they do the English of Mao's tour, which is Rock oh yeah, of Rock of Ages. Ages. Does anyone sing it in English after? Yes, you do. You really? sing it in English after you sing it in Hebrew. Do you also sing it in Hebrew? Only in English. Wow. So you say Rock of Ages. There's a million stanzas of Rock of Ages. Do you do the whole thing or like just one? You know, kind of sample the first. Okay. The whole thing. Wow, that's commitment. You know it by heart, or you're reading it every night. Wow. Okay. Okay, so they do it in Hebrew, they do it in English. Right. Some nights. Some nights they do Haneros Halalu. Haneros Halalu. Right. Then there's a Ladino one. There's a Ladino one. Which when we when we were like doing our little prep for this, Rachel was like, well, no one's going to know a Ladino one. And then I was like, I actually do know the Ladino one. Because but does anyone here? Does anyone oh, know my mom Ladino? does. Oh. Anyone Wait, else? What's it called? Ocho Candelicas? Oh, see? I got Jess knows it? Jess knows it. Oh, she won't sing it though, but she does know it. I've turned everyone off to trying to sing in public. It's like, uno candelica. Dun, dun, dun. You remember that? Ocho candelicas para mi. Dun, dun. Right? I mean, I don't like know. That. I don't know. It's amazing. It sounds it's like you go through. Great. It's like accounting, you know. You knew that? Thank you. Wow. Oh. Cute. Amazing. So I'm really into all of that. Yeah, they cycle through it They're all. They cycle through it all. Right. Any others? I think that was it. I think that was it. Um... So I was I wanted to kind of hear from you what what you sing after you light the candles. But does the, anyone sing a nice. song that's not those things? Okay, we covered it all. We covered it all. Yeah. Good. Good. Also covered in the book, I love when a book really describes what they're wearing and also kind of just really gives you a sense of who these people are. 
That's a really good thing about, I feel like the romance genre does that in a way that other genres I've read have not. It's yeah. really fun. Yeah. They have amazing slogans on their t-shirts. Yes, I'm glad you pointed this out. Chub Rub Club. Chub Rub Club. I like the one that's just called, that's just Fat Bitch. Yeah, Fat <laughs> Bitch, Chub Rub Club. Like all of their t-shirts are just like really proud of their of their fatness. Yes. And I love their shirts. Yes. There were a few more. Were there? Yeah, I took some notes on them. Can you find them? Mm-hmm. I only Netflix remember. I remember. Ch- I see that. Wow, there's a clipboard. Nair Lee was the other one. Nair Lee. Do you know the Hanukkah song Nair Lee? After you light candles, that came up. Has anyone heard of? That? Oh, we got the hand. Sing it. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Fair enough. Fatties against fascism. Yes. Love that. Love it. So good. I really love. I love the description. That's that specific. That we know. Yeah, yeah, they were describing people's clothing in a yeah. lot of specificity. So good, really nice. so good. There's that one character who always wears like rainbow colored things. Yeah, like yeah, we get a really strong sense of what everyone looks like. Yeah, I want to know more about all of them. Right. Um, the other thing is that not I like I this was a real education for us. Totally. But certain words I've tr- truly never heard before, like. and one was allistic. So when they're having a conver- when they're having conversations about their autism. Someone would, there was some, like another character, a side character that come up, c- would come up to them and say something like, well, I'm allistic, but, and right. allistic, is this a term anyone's heard? This, this meant someone who didn't have autism. Like not autistic, right. Right. Allistic. So this was interesting to me because I kind of was wondering, is this term used? Right. I've certainly never used it. Is it a word only used within the autism community? Right. It's Googleable. Like it's definitely googleable right also everything in here is based in reality because like every song every movie everything that's listed by the way zan west lists the recipes for the things that are cooked in the book at the end oh yes there's an appendix i was there's so happy to there, see that i know there's like this whole thing about the different drinks they make that like have bubbles that feel really good like a ginger lime i wanted to make that for tonight i know there but was none like of a, you read it so yeah, yeah yeah there was like a lemon lime fizzy drink someone like, was yeah like a ginger lime like, fizzy drink delicious. that sounded amazing and like yeah. was really good for them when they had different like sensory needs right i want one right now it was amazing sounding and at the end of the book is the recipe for that drink and bunch of others here's the thing during the kink lessons leah has handouts Yes. Well, she's an educator. Okay. I feel like a missed opportunity here was I want the handouts. Oh. Like there was a major appendix. Yes. Recipes. Every song listed. A is cast listed of in characters the book. with each one's like identity, profession. Pronouns. You saw them working. Gender pronouns. Gender pronouns. Like, yes. Every side character, every character we know from the beginning of the book and the end of the book. Right. The content warning of the book is pages long. Yes. Pages. Remember when I read a couple at the beginning? No, there's pages and oh, pages. Oh, that and was pages. a drop in the bucket. Mention has- of a dead parent, mention of this, mention of that, content warning for everything. Meltdowns, going nonverbal. There was like um, a former someone who, who Leah was in a former relationship with turned seeing out to be them a, at a, turned out to be a turf. And, and there was all these warnings about turfs. Yeah, there was warning about that, but also seeing an ex you don't want to see at a party. There yes. was a content warning for that, which yes. by the way, trigger warning. Totally agree. Totally. I get it. Yes. I get it. Yes. Right. But and then it had each page, so you could yes, know. Yes, you can to go skip. to the page if you don't want to read the page about the, with the scene where you, they run into an ex, a toxic ex. You could skip that page. The right. page is listed. Right. Anyway, if all of that is listed, give us the handouts. I want to see the handouts. I want nights one through eight. Right. They skip some nights, by the way, because they need breaks. So there aren't eight lessons. Right. Also, the word drop, I had never heard. Oh, yeah, drop. Okay. After the kink scenes, by the way, like, if anyone is in that community, this this just sounds so dumb. I'll just be like, by the way, like, this is this thing that happens after you have a play scene. Like, no, but is is that a kink word or it's an autism word? No, it's a kink word. Ah, mm. There's a few things in the kink community that come up, well, a lot, that come up in this book. But after a play scene where they're, like, having a sexual experience together, or, by the way, sometimes not sexual Right. Just kinky. Like right. sometimes there's pain but no sex. Right. It's not sometimes it's not sexual at all. Sometimes it's not romantic at all. Often it's often it's not romantic at all. Sometimes it's just about permission to speak, staring at boots. I say as I stare at Jess's boots. The whole night I'm just staring at your boots, thinking about Jordan's hot boots. <laughs> um looking at Molly's too, by the way. Thank you. Great boots. So thanks. So after so okay, so the person who's the submissive in this dominant submissive relationship 
often goes into this place called a subspace. By the way, if you know this again, so dumb. I'm like, who am I to even describe this? I feel so dumb right now. Whatever. But You're speaking after your these after these kink scenes, there's a thing called drop, where they I, I don't know. Feel, I don't really know. Feel thin skinned, need kind of aftercare. Well, after the scene, they need aftercare. So much cuddling. But I wonder if this is like something that's particular to these people because I think also a theme in the book is that like people misunderstand that like one of these relationships doesn't necessarily have to be like mean or like pushing the bounds of consent, which it seems like some of these earlier characters had relationships like that. It could also be like very loving and very, again, focused on actually reading what the other person wants, not ignoring it. Right. So I just wonder how much of this is, description actually translates to the general community versus like this particular group. I'd love to know, but right. I, there's so many other books we could read. I have read another. It's not, it wasn't Jewish. Okay. Probably famous. It was called the siren. Has anyone read the siren? Leah back there. No. Um, I have <laughs> read. I have has, has Leah. She's read it. She's raising her hand. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That, yeah. Great. Leah's read the siren. Yeah. Amazing. Um, that was another book about a dominant submissive relationship. They were, they were, she was collared to this guy. He right. was also, it was like, it was not a Jewish book. I think he was in it at the church actually. Um, okay. So not, not a Jewish romance. Interesting. Uh, Gentile romance. But, and did it talk about this? Did it talk about <laughs> Gentile Jewish romance? romance. <laughs> um, there's Jewish yeah, there's romance. Su- the subspace and, and aftercare. Oh, okay. I believe, I okay. believe, but not like this. Right, right, right. Not right. like this. This was so loving and delish. Right. Um, so other... So, so, so drop. So they describe themselves as feeling, as feeling thin skinned a lot. Right. Have you ever heard of that or described yourself or felt that way? I think I have felt that way and like having read the book, but I don't know that I ever would have named it in time as that. Like, thin skinned. Has anyone used thin skinned as a term? Oh, you have. Like I'm feeling thin skinned. Oh. Like sensitive. Tell, tell us more. Yes. Every, that's how I, right. that's how they felt it in the book also. Like everything's affecting you greatly. Right overly sensitive to just like everything stimuli whatever right yeah oh, yeah, yeah. it is in the book i think definitely yeah. temporary right. so during drop after these kink scenes and after after the kink scenes they would experience this drop leah needed to give jordan a full lesson on this because yes. that was one of the lessons basically because drop was something new for them right for her to, for her to learn right but they had to prepare she had to prepare for yeah um so I think that's, I don't know that that's just with them. I think that's in the kink community. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Although, again, you need a lot of time in your life. Well, right. To be able to, like, recover. Sure. And and again, a lot of, like, time that no one else has any dictate, like, no responsibilities of any kind to anyone else or anything else where you could just, like, again, retreat to your right, room. Right. Like, watch those Hobbit movies on a loop. Right. Listen to the, sometimes if, if she couldn't handle, like, if the visual images were too thin-skinned, she'd put on the Hobbit audiobook. Right. It was like all these different gradations of hobbits. Right. But this experience of like comfort reads, comfort listens. Yes, yes, a lot of comfort. And comfort foods. Comfort listens, comfort read, comfort food. I intensely related to that. Yeah, but I think also what you were saying before, like I think this is true in general. Like we were just talking about like people who are like like polyam, like ethically non-monogamous, like like we know, I know a couple who declared themselves ethically non-monogamous and then shortly after had two babies and now have two toddlers and I'm always like are they still like it takes a lot of energy yeah to like meet a couple flirt with a couple right but do whatever you're doing with the couple where are the kids like maybe they're sleeping maybe they're sleeping, I guess they're sleeping. but like you have to also plan then if what if there's like if there's drop afterward you need an audio but you need a quiet you're room like, like ah. the way that they were describing what they needed during drop but like also having your kid wake up at 6 a.m right not gonna happen i just can't see it right exactly and then what it's do like, you not do not now i'm feeling thin skin right, like right, i right. need a dark room like yeah 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 right you're stealing my velvet weighted blanket yeah <laughs> like your kid's peeing exactly on yeah like i need that granola bar in this moment because it's crunchy and i want it right Right, but you're not going to get no. it. No. Right. So I don't know. It seems hard. It, this seems hard with kids. Right. Yeah, that's well, what we were saying. saying. So like yeah. they do have jobs, but it In felt to us. Like, yes, Leah owns a sex store and is a kink educator and Jordan works at a nonprofit. Right, because Leah went to Jordan's like holiday work holiday party. That was a whole scene in the book. Yes, but based on the amount of conversation, the only thing you hear about her job is the holiday party. Like right. that's it. Right. It's like, 
maybe she was off for two weeks for the hot for winter break. It is that time of year, right? Like maybe things are slow. Uh, this was the this was right, that then. Right. Uh, maybe this was that. They had a lot that. yeah. They were just rich New Yorkers who have a lot of time. Like right. It's like time all is the, money. right. You're in a coffee shop Tuesday at ten AM. You're like, who are all of you? Right. Right. You all have a seven dollar latte and you're all like here on Tuesday at ten AM. Yeah, okay. So it really is a New York City uh, you know, vibe there. It was. Oh, yeah. the book's super New York y. Right. Yeah. We didn't talk about also the Shah the Shahfianu. Oh, yeah. That's a huge so they, thing. So they they stim a lot and they also they talk about their stimming. So I mean people with autism sometimes stim where they maybe rock or or do a repetitive um sound. They might they might um say something over and over at different moments, like not over and over repeatedly, but maybe there's something that they say at different times in their life or different times in the day. Um they might script, they might use language that they've heard from a movie from a song from something there's a lot of rocking and stimming and they need to do that at certain times but one thing that I loved is that a stim that or kind of like a stereotypical repetitive behavior that Jordan has is saying the Shehechianu and so like at different moments right like in like a highly kinky oh yeah scene right she's right it's like Shehechianu like guys guys like <laughs> just like my mom's here but like Jordan was fisting Leah and said the Shehechianu. Right. My mom's whispering like what's fisting, but like, it's like, my mo- like, Jordan was fisting Leah and said the Shehechianu. Like, right. it's very beautiful. Right. It's so, oh, yeah. it's so Jewish. Totally. And there's Shehechianu with clamps. There's Shehechianu with. Oh, Shehechianu with clamps. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's like Shehechianus at every turn with a lot of. A lot of, of Shehechianus. At first I got confused because I was like, oh, first night of Hanukkah. I missed it at first. No, no. Because that's like you say the two blessings and then you say the Shehechianu, the first night of Hanukkah. Right. No. This was not a halachic shakhya. No. Right. No, this was like uh, repetitive behavior. But also like something about market. Like it, meaningful. But it was market. No, it was a it meaningful was repetitive marking, behavior. A meaningful of first experience. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, loved that. Okay. And then the other thing is that another new term that I learned, I don't know if, if you knew it, but so uh, asexual I've heard, obviously gray asexual, gray ace I didn't know, but then allosexual. No, I didn't know that one either. Like people who are attracted to other people or oh, right do, like do it's, want it's, sex. it's like, like allistic it's like the right like the opposite so there's like asexual and then but the opposite wasn't sexual right it's like allosexual allosexual right i didn't know that word like being interested in sex period ever right to anybody no not to anybody just no ev- not not everybody just ever to anybody Right. Like, I think you would think of the word opposite to, of asexual as sexual. Mommy, who's nodding. But there, th- the term in the book was allosexual, not sexual. Like, right. the opposite of asexual is allosexual. Being sexually attracted, period. Not to everyone at all times. Just in general, ever. Rebecca Simon's giving me a thumbs up, like, we get it. So, we can move I feel on. That maybe my mom doesn't, but Rebecca it's does. It's okay. Oh, she gets it too. Great. Okay. Um, so again, a lot of, a lot, I learned a lot. I was thinking about like, okay, so part of the book is also that Leah discover is discovering that she's gray ace, which we already talked about, but I still think it's like stone fox, uh, silver fox, but right. I know that's my first association too, but we all know. So it's like, right. There's sometimes, but I just felt like I like that because I feel like isn't there a little gray ace in all of us? Like it's like we, it's like, yeah, like sometimes (laughs) you're. Sometimes you're in the, like, what? Do you, <laughs> same thought where it's like, if I just, like, <laughs> what? Well, it's like, if you just don't want to have sex one night, are you gray ace? Right. But like, no. I don't think so. No, 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 no. But like, certain circumstances where you're just like, this might make me feel like, this makes me, their, their perception of sex. My mom's like, sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you're tired. Right. No, I hear that. Sometimes you're tired. But also, it's more than that. It's like a repulsion at the it's exa- thought exactly. of sex. It's, it's not, not just about. Like, it's I'm not tired. like I don't want to right now. Let's get into bed earlier tomorrow. Right, it's right, like right. no, no, no. It's like I'm repulsed by the thought of by the idea of. There's this. repulsion. Yeah. There's and sex repulsed is a term she uses. Yes, yes. Yes. But I do think it's like she's so tuned in to like what she wants at any given moment, and that and a part of her, the grayness is just that is right. like being willing to respond to those things. Right, because sometimes she's sex repulsed, but sometimes she's interested in it. Or there's like certain aspects of it she's interested in, but not others. Right. And that's a lot of like, there's a lot of negotiation. Right. 
There was a negotiation handout that was mentioned that I thought would have been interesting too. I want to see all the handouts. There's also some spreadsheets I'm interested in. I have an aversion to spreadsheets actually in general, but like I, I want to see hers. What was the spreadsheet? There was like there was uh, there was some spread. There was a spreadsheet at some point. Huh. Okay. It had to do with the lessons. The other thing is that Lee is sensitive to the fact that Jordan is neurodivergent and so learns in different ways. And so the lessons were actually like there were visuals, like there was a chart, I think. Like there were, yeah. she was sensitive to no understanding that because Jordan has autism, just like she does, she might need some extra ways to learn the lessons. I do have a memory that back in the day, my roommate on the Upper West Side, Miriam, had a dating spreadsheet where she would record the guy she was going out with and just like a few details about them and she would call it her dating file. Yes. And there was one time where she was like, oh, I'm going on this date. And she's like, oh my God, he's already in the dating file. Like he's number 32. I totally forgot. Wait, I feel like you don't remember this story, but someone that we know also had a spreadsheet. I went on a date with him. Okay, I went on a date with this guy in the Upper West Side. I don't think he's here. And he, (laughs) or watching, and we went out. It was fine. We, I, it was cl- we weren't going to go on a second date. Like, it was fine. Right. I went to the bathroom. He paid. It was pouring out. He came back. His credit card was gone. He had a spreadsheet. Years later, years later, Malia meets William. Yes. They reconnect with this guy that I went on this date with. Also, it was raining. He didn't walk me home in the rain. It was like, not a good date. I remember the story as this guy didn't walk me home in the rain. The, the story, my story was this that was, was a mediocre story. to bad date. Never going to see him again. He didn't walk me home in the rain. He that had was an my umbrella story. and you didn't. That yeah, was he had an umbrella I, and I didn't. Yeah, thank you. And years later, he's like, Rachel's your stepsister? Wait, we went on a date once and I had this dating spreadsheet. And under Rachel's name, it says, girl who stole my credit card. Because he came back and the credit card was missing. Because I came back from the bathroom and the credit card was missing. It's really funny. I didn't steal it if you're watching on Instagram Live. (laughs) But you didn't walk her home in the rain. But you didn't walk me home in the rain. Right. Did he have a spreadsheet with that in it? He had a spreadsheet and he, when he, he, William knows, he was like, wait, I had a a dating spreadsheet and next to your stepsister's name, it says says, girl who stole my credit card. Wow. I don't know what number I was. I was. Pr- I mean, I don't know. I don't know what number he was. That's probably an extensive spreadsheet. I'm just gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know uh-huh. the credit card number. <laughs> um. So yes, yeah, some spreadsheets. So, so the, I've heard of anyone here. Ca- did anyone here keep a dating spreadsheet ever? Yes. Oh. Wow. Amazing. Okay. See, these one things time, are helpful. One time, my friend, who's probably watching because she can't be here tonight, called me up and she was like, "I met someone wonderful." And I was like, in my head, like, which ex of mine is she dating? Like, what? That's like, she's prefacing it by, I met someone wonderful. I think you may know him. He was my therapist. That's a true story. I remember that. Yeah. I mean, all these stories are true. Like, how could you come up with that? If I did, I would be writing, not podcasting. Wait, did they date for a while? I forget what happened there. Yeah, they did. I remember that. One saw him at a Hanukkah party. He mm-hmm. was like, I once saw him at her Hanukkah party. Oh. He was like flustered and like picked up socks. It was so weird. Oi, socks. Because <laughs> he was like flustered, you know? I do. Like, I don't know why he picked up socks. He was like, are these yours? I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, why would are there socks there? I don't know, actually. <laughs> yeah, like maybe. Also they tonight, like, like a bar mitzvah. Socks? My whole family bought Rip Bada shirts and is wearing them. Also like a bar mitzvah, which made me really happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the idea the that like show. we're at the event, I have to put it on is like like a from like, you know, like totally. wedding thing. Like, yeah. Right. We have, someone has to dance in front of us right here. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So yeah. So you had a spreadsheet, a list. Also funny, the same friend who dated my therapist once went on a couple of dates with a guy that I went on a couple of dates with. But after my couple of dates with him, I was like, it was so nice. He wanted to know what I wanted to eat because he wanted to share because it'll be fun if we like shared multiple dishes and then she was like he did that with me too that's just like how he orders it's like stop thinking that's cute <laughs> yeah right right you're on the same wavelength yeah Jubu yeah right. yeah we've all known this yeah we've known some yeah we've yeah. known some yeah yes. we probably know that guy actually yeah it could, it could be. be we could talk about it after because yeah, we're recording G- gotta break out that list could be okay it's so a small Jewish world as my mom always says by the way, guess what happened tonight? My colleague knew my, my neighbor and my neighbor ran into a friend from work because it's a small Jewish world. So they didn't nice. know they were going to be here. Really great. One degree. Right. One degree. 
Well, we're stepsister, but we would have been friend en- friends anyway. Right. We've discussed this before. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything else on this book? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, t- to me, like the pivotal Jewish scene here is that there's one night where they're lighting the menorah together and... It's not just Jordan and Lee. It's like a bunch of their friends, a lot of whom seem to be in these sort of amorphous, like polyamorous situations where they're like, they call each other family and they... Yeah, so leather family. Leather, leather family. family. Right, right, right. There's Sounds family. honestly like heartwarming to me. I don't know. I just loved it. They were also nice to each other. Yeah, they really were. And very attuned. Like they were like, you seem thin skinned. Would you like a cuddle? Yeah. And like, they'd be like, yes, I would. And then they would like move They would like the move into, yeah, like, and then just be like spooned in a sandwich between these like... Right, until someone people. brought out tea sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So th- the thing is, then they were like, they were lighting candles and one of them, you know, they were saying how the, the holiday is celebrating like the, the, you know, Jews triumph over Greek oppression. And then they compared it to sort of all the oppression that they themselves had experienced in trying to sort of find and be seen and represent and and you know, related to for their genuine identities, whether it was sort of their gender identities, their sexual identities, their body identities, their neurodiverse identities. And they had all these like systems of oppression that were, that they felt were sort of forcing them down. But Judaism wasn't one of them. They saw Judaism as like an identity of liberation that like was part of what, <laughs> right? That's Wasn't gorgeous. that beautiful? That's I just gorgeous. thought it was so beautiful. Like, uh. um, they were just like, there was nothing negative whatsoever about their Jewish identities. It was like this source of just strength and positivity. That is, it's very true. Yeah. And beautiful. I just, that was yeah. so lovely. Yeah, it really was. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But you know, I do think that people these days have been thinking about like, should I wear my Mugain David? Like, do I feel comfortable putting my menorah in the window? Right. Like, And the thing I was thinking, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think a lot of us have been and, um, if my mom wasn't wearing her Hamsa or Magain David at LAX when I was 13, I wouldn't have met Ryan Gosling. <laughs> Guys, I met Ryan Gosling because of my mom proudly showing wearing her Jewish star. I mean, if that's fearlessly, not going to push everyone over the Fearlessly. Edge, he saw my mom's star. Right. He heard my father's Israeli accent. He's like, are you Israeli? Are you guys Jewish? I'm about to film this movie. He was talking about the believers, by the way, because it was 1998 when this happened. And he was older and hot. And I was like, he was like a little like horny middle schooler. "Ah." And he was so hot. How old was he? He was like 16 He was like 15 or 16. He's a couple years older than us. Yeah. Yeah. But he felt much older. Sure, sure. He was flying alone. He's Ryan Gosling. Yeah, he was Ryan Gosling before he was Ryan Gosling, though, because so basically then he was like, I... Um, maybe you, when I'm, I have to learn Hebrew for the movie, maybe you could tutor me, Israeli man, my dad. Maybe you could tutor me. And my mom was also like very worried because he was traveling alone. So she was like, you're going to be in New York alone. Like, you're going to be in New York alone. And, and, and got his number, got, got Ryan Gosling's number. He wrote Ryan Gosling in his number in a notepad. It was like a spiral notebook that we had on us. And we, we don't actually don't. I've looked for it. And also my, we s- later sold the house. I've, I've looked for the book a lot. We, we don't have it. We don't have Ryan Gosling's number anymore. Yeah, but yeah, I know, so. right, I've heard these stories, though, where, like, people get celebrities' old numbers. Like, someone has Lena Dunham's old number and often texts back, which I think is funny. Like, this isn't her. Um, anyway, he was so worried. Yes. Yeah, we were worried about him, but he was fine. He's riding it first class. We're like, who is this person? But then, by the way, his luggage in New York didn't arrive. My mom wouldn't leave the airport till his luggage came because she was worried about him. We didn't know he was going to be Ryan Gosling. We didn't know what he was going to become. We didn't know he was going to be Ken. He was just like a cute 15-year-old. And when we got home that night, I signed on to AOL, and I typed Ryan Gosling. Yeah, my mom called the hotel to make sure he was okay. He was. He was fine, but we were worried, and we thought also that my Abba was going to tutor him in Hebrew. Like, I was already, like, certain of it. And also because he was, like, he introduced us to the producer of the movie at the luggage carousel back at JFK or or LaGuardia. Except he had us. He had us. Just us. So we waited with him until his luggage came. The story's getting exaggerated in a great way, but the thing is that if my mom wasn't proudly wearing her star, we wouldn't have met Ryan Gosling. Also... I know he remembers this. I know it sounds weird because, oh, wait, I didn't tell you when I signed on to AOL when I got home. I know it sounds weird because he's obviously met so many people, but I know he remembers. Don't you feel like he remembers, mommy? 
Yeah, he definitely remembers. Everyone else agrees too. He remembers. Also, the whole reason it happened is because we were lost at LAX. Like we were like turning down like different parts of the airport. We were following each other. We were alone. Like we went down like a path that you weren't really supposed to go down. Yeah, we trauma bonded before the term even existed. He knows. And he made the show. Oh, it's like the blind leading the blind. He made like a little joke. It's Let's not just really pull this back to Bahamsa now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Molly is done. <laughs> anyway, well, I was going to tell you what happened when I signed on to AOL, which had nothing to do with the Bahamsa. But in this book. Yes. They, they are proud to be Jewish and it's just a part of who they are. It's a, the fabric of who they are. Right. And it's freedom for them. Totally. Yeah. Anyway, really beautiful. sorry about that veering off. No, no. It was, it was, it was lovely. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, yeah, you meet celebrities. Yeah. Now, we were, you know, we... Of yeah, of course. Right. Sometimes you keep a spreadsheet of them. You should. It's a shorter spreadsheet than the other one, but, you know. You it's never It's actually know. very long. Is it's it? It's actually very long. We, yeah, it's actually very long. I'm not going to, you know, yeah, I'm I mean, not going to bore you, but in other episodes, I know that you listen, or you will. Are there spread... You have multiple celebrities you've met because you've been wearing Jewish pride no. paraphernalia? No. No. Just multiple that Just I've celebrities met. you've met. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah, of course. We could talk about more of those. I mean, on the know, podcast on in the general, because yeah, yeah, we're yeah. just getting started. It's our one year anniversary. Right. But right, it's right. really, we're just getting started. There's more to come. There's more to um, come. We're reading Heidi Shertok's book next, Unorthodox Love. Yes. We'll be re- recording it in a week or two. We yes. record two a month. And you can check out, we have a whole catalog of episodes to listen to. Yeah, if like you 20, 26. 26, to be, to be precise. Um, thank you so much for being here. Does anyone have any questions? Anything, any advice we could give? Yeah, ask us anything. Aaron, do you? You seem like you want to say something. You? Oh, no, no. He doesn't. You don't. Don't put him on the spot. No, no, you don't. I thought you did. Oh, we have a, qu- a hand. Hi. Hi. I'll stand up. Um, what's the best book that you've reviewed on your podcast? Do you have a recommend? Do you recommend yes, any do. of these? Because this was really fun to listen, but I'm never going to read that book. Um, I love, like, I actually, should, actually loved listening. But, okay, great. But I'm curious about, yeah. Okay, um, we both loved Going by Coastal by Dahlia Adler. It was so good. It shocked us. It's YA, and I've never before- read a YA. I I have totally a bias against YA. Rachel knows a very funny story where I <laughs> joined a book club, and I was like, "Oh, we're reading a very highly acclaimed book." And I went to the bookstore, Barnes and Noble, and I was like, "Why isn't this here?" And I went up to the informational desk, and they were like, "Oh, you need to go into the children's section." <laughs> Yeah, Molly. <laughs> Molly like, I was like, oh, yeah, there it is. There's the going by coastal. Section. Look, Leah has oh, it. Yeah. Going by coastal so by good. Dahlia Adler. It is. It's signed. Oh my god. It is so good. It really changed my mind it's, about YA. It, we loved it. It's set in New York. It's also like she's in high school, but they're all extremely mature and very cool. And it's like, what if she stayed on the Upper West Side for the summer? What would happen? And it's like, would this crush that she has on this girl, this barista evolve? Or what if she goes to move to LA for the summer to work at her mom's office? And then she has an office crush with this hot guy and you see both stories, every other chapter, what would happen with the girl here and what would happen with the guy there? Right. It's so good. She's just like a mature, self-confident, like proud Jewish teenager. I loved going by coastal. It's my number one recommendation that we've read. Totally agreed. Wow, really good. Wow, so that's our recommendation. And you could buy it tonight. Sign. Dahlia Adler loved that episode too, which made me re- made us excited. Yeah, 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 yeah. We record, yeah, but read it and then listen. Getting DMs from the authors we review, I think, is a highlight of this whole year. Oh, absolutely. Molly and I went into this like really with no expectations. Literally, William just thought it was going to be like a fun talk, like we were just going to chat. He's like, yeah, you guys should talk more on Zoom. It's cute. <laughs> Um, but like this is an actual true honor to be able to talk to you live here I, I was read w- once I heard about the Rip Bodice I think in 2016 2017 like, I was waiting to make the pilgrimage to LA to go to the store so when I heard that it was opening here I was buzzing um, so it's like an actual dream come true being able to sit here totally. with you Mel talking about this book but before we wrap up are there any other questions or any other advice anything we could we have opinions on everything we really do before we started, actually, we were talking about different seltzer flavors. We don't need to bore you with that. But if you do want to talk about it, I'm happy to later. Herring flavors, too. I can talk oh, about yeah. That. Herring flavors. Mm. Mm. What's the sexiest, sexiest thing, thing about, about being Jewish was the question. Sexiest Jewish holiday is something we talk about a lot. But sexiest thing about being Jewish. Interesting. Mm. My husband wearing that Hanukkah apron is pretty sexy right now. It really is. 
It really is. <laughs> I don't know like I find that our holidays and traditions and I find it all very intimate like being mm. together celebrating lighting candles singing songs together I know a lot of times we're doing it with family and kids and like there's something about that that doesn't feel sexy but I really think that those things are like I don't know like scooping like that crusty part of potato kugel like out of the corner of a pan like you know mm. and then passing it to someone you love like I find that I find all of our traditions to be sexy totally but it has to be that burnt corner mm. yeah and all the talking is sexy. Yeah. I don't know. Jews talk a lot. We do. Although your sister, our, your sister would, uh, Rachel's sister, Gal, who's an probably amazing, watching, probably watching and is an amazing artist and designed our, our art, our, um, our art, our art for our podcast, which is awesome. Um, Wasn't interested in the podcast because there's too much talking. Exactly. She's like, it's too much talking. It is a podcast. It but is. anyway. No dance break. So it's not sexy. Talking's not sexy for everyone. But what is that? Does anyone else have any ideas about what the sexiest thing about being Jewish is? Yeah. Intelligent, creative, witty, a yes. hand. Intimate. Ooh, rapping to fill oh, in yes. is hot. All, All that black. <laughs> I had a rabbi who demonstrated rapping to fill in for us when I was in high school. And I felt like that that was almost borderline inappropriate. Yeah, because you were like, I'd be like were, sweating. It was like a room full of 16-year-old girls who were in an all-girls school. Yeah, it was like a, a, you know, rabbi comes in, like rolls up his sleeve, starts rapping. We're all like <laughs> panting. Yeah, I would literally, I would just be, be sweating. Totally, yeah. everyone was sweating. And, yeah. you know, he must have been enjoying that a little bit. Come on. Of course. Right, right. That's why he did it. Exactly. You needed to learn that? No, we didn't. There it wasn't was no egalita- practical it wasn't application for us whatsoever. No, no. It wasn't egalitarian. No, we were never doing that. No, no, no. But we were all thinking about it when we went home. Yeah. Right. Any other sexy Jewish anything? My mom thinks that Jews dirty talk and other cultures don't. Oh, talk. My mom talks during sex is wow. what she's saying. Whew. Now who's sweating? <laughs> My mom thinks that Jews talk during sex. That's great. A, gr- a great place to stop. A great place was- to stop. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the Rip Bodice. Thank you, everyone. Love you, Ma. Love you. Happy, Happy Hanukkah, Monica. everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. We can keep going if you want. Um, I just feel like I should say for the record, my name is Leah, and the character's name is Leah. We are not. They were sometimes referring to me. Yeah. So, in case you got confused. Um, thank you so much for coming. We have almost every single book mentioned tonight. So if you like any of those, please feel free. Please eat all the lovely food that was brought. Um, if you bought a ticket online and didn't check in, please do so because you get a $15 store credit. Um, so don't let that go to waste. Um, and thank you for coming and happy Hanukkah. Oh. Two other quick things is that this these period products from this company Tend, they sent us period products. Also, this podcast is produced by William Levin. We couldn't do it without him. William. William. And this podcast is brought to you by Hanukkah Pong, which is a menorah-shaped beer pong. And if someone wants to tell me a number, two people want to tell me two. Molly, think of a number between one and 100. I'm going to think of a number between one and 100. We're going to give away a free Hanukkah Pong right now. And also, thank you so much to Lee Mars, audio engineer extraordinaire, for helping us do all this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. um, We're thinking of two numbers between one and 100. Wait, hold on. I'm not thinking yet. Okay. Does anyone else have a number? Because otherwise I'm going to... No, but someone was very close. Should someone I give it? Someone was close too. To yeah. It... 78! The 77 was about to get it. This podcast is brought to you by Hanukkah Pong, available on Amazon. Wait, I still have a number. Oh, 13! Yes! Woo!